tonight and for some time to come, my plan is to speak on the matter of change. The title for this series is Living a Changed Life. And the scripture that will serve as the foundation for this study is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a very familiar uh, passage of scripture on this subject. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This term on the screen here may look like Greek to you, and if, that's, if it does, that's good because it is. Uh, it's really hard to even pronounce, but we get our word metamorphosis from it. I'm sure you'll recognize that. Uh, it's actually a compound word, and it means uh, across or move plus the form of, so literally to change the shape or form of, to take a new form. Two very good examples of that is the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly or a tadpole to a bullfrog. Now, this is not, this is not something that just grows. Uh, it's something that becomes totally different. It starts out as one thing, changes form, and becomes another thing. Now, that's transformation. It's interesting to note that the New Testament term repent or repentance comes from a Greek word that's akin to metamorphosis. It's a little bit different, but it means on the one hand change, and on the other mind, a transformation of the mind. That's what repentance is, right? Uh, we're thinking this way over here, and uh, as a result of that, our behavior follows. And then uh, we have metanoia, which is repentance. That means we have a change of mind. We start thinking this way, and our behavior changes with our thinking. Well, all of that has to do with transformation. And according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, God's will for you, God's will for me, is that we experience this, this transformation. Now, we're going to get very specific in this study about God's process for that. Tonight, we're, we're, not, we're kind of working our way to all of that, okay? Uh, but we're going to talk about the Word of God and the role that God's Word plays in the process of transformation, how it leads to godly sorrow, that godly sorrow in our heart causes us to repent, that is, to turn uh, to God, repentance, brings about conversion, and conversion then leads to uh, what the New Testament calls sanctification. All of, the, all of that is a part of the process that God uses to transform us, not just to grow us. Now, I hope you're growing as a Christian, but to grow as a Christian, that means you've got these good things going on already, and you're just getting better at those things. Now, that's growth, okay? But that's not transformation. That's, that's kind of what happens in addition to uh, transformation once that occurs. But transformation is going from one thing to another thing. That's transformation. And friend, if you don't have transformation, uh, you can't go to hell. Did you know that? I mean, not only can you not please God because you struggle in your life with sin that you're not overcoming and you're defeated and that's uh, displeasing to God, but you cannot go to heaven. Jesus once had these children. He brought these children put them in his lap. And he says, he uses them to teach this, uh, this principle. We'll talk about this in a, in a uh, upcoming lesson, but I just want to mention it here just to make the point. How, just to say how important transformation is why we need to study it. But Jesus says, look at these little children. He says, unless you become converted, unless you become like these little children, uh, be converted, accept me and all that has to do with me, uh, he says you can't, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Conversion is really the result of 
transformation. But you know, before we can really get into God's process for transformation, we've got to deal with some garbage. Uh, I don't really know how else to say it. We've got to take out the trash. So in tonight's lesson, we're going to talk just for a little bit about some faulty change methods. These are some uh, wrong ways to go about change. Now Satan wants us to, to do all of this. And he knows uh, that it's not going to work. You need to know that it's not going to work. And you need to do away with these faulty change methods and go to the source of where real change happens. And that's with God and God's process. I remember my mother barking the order uh, when I was growing up. Take out the garbage! To me and my brother. She had to bark it because we didn't, we didn't want to take out the garbage. I don't know what it was. Somehow or another, there's, there's two of us, just two. And somehow we both remembered that we were the one, each of us, that took the garbage out the week before. But uh, I guess it was because in the garbage, you know, there's garbage. Uh, coffee grounds, eggshells, whatever. You know, food scraps and all that. It's not anything you want to save. And it's, you know, you, it's work. you got to actually get out and do it. And we didn't, we didn't, we didn't love work. But my mother would bark that order, take out the garbage, and we'd have to do it. It's not a pleasant thing sometimes to deal with uh, garbage. But until you take out the trash, of, I mean these faulty change methods, until, until you rake those off the table into the, into the garbage can and take that garbage out to the curb where the garbage men can come and pick it up, until you do that, you're going to be spinning your wheels where change is concerned. So, you may have tried, and here's the problem, you may have tried to change, as I have, and you failed uh, using some of these faulty methods. And what happens when you try to change and you fail? Well, you, it hurts, doesn't it? When you fail at something, you know, you I need to deal with this. I, I've got to somehow get past this. And you try, and you fail, and that hurts. And you try that a few times, and then the next thing you know, you just say, well, I don't know which hurts worse, the knowing that I need to change or trying to change and failing. So I just won't try. But I want to say something to you. When we pursue change God's way, that works. That will work. Mm -hmm. If you've tried to change and you failed, it's because you have tried to change according to the methods of the world, unbiblical methods. That's the garbage that we need to take out, faulty change methods. We need to uncover the faulty change methods, and then we need to sweep them into the garbage, and we need to take them out once and for all, and focus exclusively on God's program for change. It's ugly work dealing with the trash, but it's got to get done if we're going to change. I heard someone say uh, just the other day, in fact, if I keep doing what I've always done, I'm going to keep getting what I've always gotten. And you know the definition of insanity. To keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Well, that's, that's insanity. Now, we're going to look at some faulty uh, change methods that you might would consider uh, psychological change methods and we're going to look at some that might actually be considered spiritual change methods but there's thought in them and I want to say this though before we get started because somebody's going to leave here saying I'm crazy probably they're going to say ah, I disagree and that's okay disagree uh, if you feel like you need to go home and study it come back we'll talk about it uh, but I want you to understand that I am not saying that there's no truth in these methods. I'm not going to say that. There's some truth in these methods. That's the problem. You know how it is with a lie? I mean a lie that really takes hold and people start buying into it. What's the problem with that lie? The, the little bit of truth that's in it, right? 
So I'm not going to I'm not going to say here's a faulty change method. It's absolutely wrong from top to bottom. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say there's some truth in that, and maybe there's some Bible truth in that. But there's enough fault in it to put it in the garbage. Okay, you know what I'm saying? All right, let's look at some faulty change methods. Number one, the environmental change uh, method. Uh, that's very popular. In fact, it was made popular by John Watson and later by B.F. Skinner. And if you've studied uh, psychology, you've heard those names. We had to study that pretty hard in my nursing classes in college. You'll recognize this concept as behaviorism. And it's very, very popular, but it is faulty. Now, there's some truth in it, but it's faulty. It's a faulty approach to change. Behaviorism is the idea that the environment conditions of a person... Uh, cause that person to behave in certain ways and the result of that idea is if you change the environment, you change the person. Now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that evil communications corrupt good manners, so okay, a bad environment, fix that. Fix that, okay? I'm not saying otherwise. But uh, you understand that when you, when when you fix the environment, you've not fixed you. That's the problem with behaviorism. In fact, that's the problem with all these faulty change methods. Um, Skinner and Watson, what they did was they relied very heavily upon the findings of an experiment conducted by a Russian psychologist named Pavlov. Um, you remember this guy, he did an experiment. Um, this dude took some dogs and made them slop. Probably made a lot of money in the process, but he put food in front of those dogs and those dogs would begin to salivate at the sight of the food, and then he rang a bell just seconds before the food appeared. After countless repetitions of hearing the bell, followed by getting tasty food, the dog would salivate simply upon hearing the bell, even when no food was laid out. And he concluded that the dog had been changed by his environment, and he called that conditioning. That's what that's called. Now, from these findings, Pavlov and later Skinner and Watson concluded that most, if not all, human behavior is the result of conditioning. Now, as with most psychological theories, there is some validity here. Certainly, behavior is influenced by patterns of thinking that's formed over a long period of time. But here the problem is, there's two problems here. Number one, there's no cause and effect relationship uh, necessarily between environment and change. Let me give you a good example. They've done all kinds of studies on twins. And these two twins come from the same parents, live in the same home, grow up the same way, and turn out completely different. Um, though it may be a factor in who you become, environment is not the determinant. It is not the determining cause in character formation in a person's transformation. I did not come from a Christian home environment. In fact, I would say my family was dysfunctional. Uh, but that did not keep me from coming to be converted, to know God, to know and understand the truth of God, and to live my life under the authority of God. You understand what I'm saying? The cause and effect just isn't necessarily there. Now, if you listen to this, what will end up happening is you'll be a victim. You'll say, oh, well, it's, it's my environment. It's not me. And you'll never actually be able to find what God has to offer that will enable you to change. Changing also, number two, the environment does not automatically change the person. A perfect environment does not lead to a perfect person. That's true. We see that in the Bible with Adam and Eve. They were in a perfect environment. What did they do? They chose to disobey God and to sin against God. So, so environment does not absolutely control who I am or what I become. Now again, there's some truth in that. If you, if you are being influenced negatively by people who are sinning, people that are living uh, in rebellion against God, you might want to consider getting out of that environment, uh, but getting out of that environment doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be transformed. Consider just as an example the prodigal son. Uh, now, here's a guy who said, you know what? I'm going to change my environment. Uh, I just, Dad, I don't like living here, you know. I don't know, maybe maybe rules and stuff like that. And I'm tired of working on this stupid farm. And uh, my brother's getting on my nerves. And 
Uh, maybe those kind of things, I don't know. But anyway, he said, I'm getting out of here. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing big time. You can read the story for yourself in Luke chapter 15, but it says there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. That's verses 11 through 14. Now, he finally found a job, uh, I suppose working on a farm and there he ended up feeding the pigs and wanting to eat the, the food that the pigs were eating. Verses 17 and 18 report that he came to himself and when he came to himself, that means uh, uh, he realized something. He came to himself and this is what he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more food than enough uh, but I perish here with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Now here's the point. He thought his environment was the problem. His family, the way he was brought up, the lifestyle that he was being subjected to, so he took off and got a new environment. The Bible says when he came to himself, he figured out that the environment wasn't the problem. He was the problem. Now, Satan wants you to think that everything's the problem except the problem. And the problem, I'm telling you, is you. <laughs> I'm so mean. <laughs> but when you figure that out, you're on your way. You're on your way. I'm the problem. Uh, how many of you have heard of Amy Winehouse? She is such an awesome example of the point I'm making. Just She's a recent example of it. Uh, she's famous. She had like a 10-year stretch there where she was just, everybody was hearing about Amy Winehouse. She had success. And there was an exclamation point with drugs and alcohol. Her life was a mess. The song that she's noted for is uh, entitled Rehab. Have you heard that song? No, no, no. She said, no rehab for me. Do you know the truth is she'd been into rehab many times. And what she's saying in that song is, many believe, is that she, what she understood was, I can keep going into rehab, and I can go into rehab, and go into rehab, and go into rehab. Like, you know, a lot of these celebrities, they have, it's a revolving door policy. They're just coming in and out and in and out with drug abuse and alcohol addiction. And they're just hoping that sooner or later, one of those visits is going to do it. That it's going to stick and they're going to be able to change and be transformed. But Amy Winehouse, she realized, rehab's never going to help me until something happens to me. She said, I'll not go back to rehab. She was so discouraged, she couldn't find the answer that she just gave way to her reckless living, and she just drove herself to death with alcohol. She just gave up. Her tragic end is a warning to all of us of the destructive ends of sin if it is not resolved by the Redeemer. If God doesn't fix us, if we do not let God fix us, we're not going to get fixed. Our problem is inside of us, not around us necessarily. We are the ones who need to change, not our environment. Behaviorism is deceptive. It's just like a window dressing. It does not work. Put that in the trash. That's what I'm saying. <coughs> Number two, digging up my past. That's a popular notion today. We hear a lot about that. Uh, I am what I am because of my past. The psychological theory that seeks to remedy our problems from the past is psychoanalysis. Do you know who's, uh, who's behind that? Sigmund Freud. That's right. He developed that well over a hundred years ago. Man, it stuck like glue. Mm -hmm. Freud taught that human behavior is determined by painful memories that we bury or suppress in our subconscious mind. And he believed that we force from our conscious mind any awareness of thoughts and needs and experiences that are unacceptable to us and others, and we 